Hey, turn with me in your Bible to the book of Philippians, New Testament book of Philippians. I want to say this to you as you turn to chapter 1, verse 27. I want to say this to you, Philippians 1, 27. Did you know that there's no perfect Christian or perfect church? I'm just asking, did you know that? Because I have news for you. You won't find it anywhere. You won't find it anywhere. Surprise, surprise. So if you remember Gomer Pyle, you could just hear him saying, surprise, surprise, surprise. There is no surprise in that statement. But what I want you to know is that we're going to look at a church today in the New Testament called the Church of Philippi that literally was probably as close to being a church that mimicked or reflected a, an expression of Christianity the likes of which we probably haven't ever seen. Really, when we look at this book called Philippians, through the lens of, you know, commentaries and reading it over and over again and just pondering what it has to teach us, you will find that in this particular passage, there is no conflict being addressed. Like in Galatians and a couple of other, the Pauline epistles, the apostle comes in and corrects the church because he says, these are things you need to change. But in today's passage, in this particular book of the Bible, in Philippians, we're not finding correction. We're actually finding that great exhortation to continue to be who they are and to be aware of some things that could invade their lives, that could shift their, uh, their, 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 their expression of pure Christianity in a way that would send it directionally where it shouldn't go. So let's jump in. Let's look at Philippians chapter 1, verse 27 is where we'll begin. We're going to go all the way through chapter 2, verse 4. So those, uh, what do we got? Uh, eight verses of Scripture. Um, now, let me just, before we jump in, let me just touch on this. That this is the third week in a series we're doing called Living My Jesus Story. And I, I got to tell you that the, the book of Philippians, if you didn't already catch this, is one of my favorite books in the New Testament, probably top three. I love this book because it exemplifies and just oozes with joy. That's really the theme throughout the book. Four little chapters that make up the book of Philippians. And what you'll find in those four chapters is you're going to find great exhortation to be joyful in your journey. How many know that we need to see joy expressed in the lives of believers today like never before? Right? We're, we're, we're seeing so much division. I can't tell you how frustrating it is for us as believers to be so divided with other Christians today and other churches today and, and across the nation to see the divide. In the name of Jesus, may we declare that God's going to bring healing and restoration, not just to the nation, but to his church. So anyway. Philippians chapter 1. Listen, okay, I'm going to start, I'm going to read out the Amplified. No matter what version you have, you'll, you'll be able to pick these things up. But I love how the Amplified does just that. It gives a little bit more clarity as to what we're trying to say. Philippians 1.27. Only be sure to lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I do come and see you or remain absent in jail, I will hear about you that you are standing firm in one spirit, one purpose, with one mind, striving side by side, as if in combat, for the faith of the gospel. Verse 28, and in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponents, for such constancy and fearlessness on your part is a clear sign, a proof and a seal for them of their impending destruction, but a clear sign for you of deliverance and salvation, and that too from God. Verse 29, for you have been granted the privilege for Christ's sake, not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer for his sake. Most of us would like to just erase that particular verse, verse 28 or 29, that says we don't, there's not going to ever be suffering. Never been promised to us, friends, never. Verse 30, and of course the apostle is writing from jail, so he should know better than anyone what persecution may look like. I don't know about you, but very few people in our church are right now in jail because of their faith. I'm not saying it's not coming. I'm just saying as of right now, we need to make sure that we're not calling it persecution. All right. 
all right? A touch, I, I know I'm kind of meddling a little bit. Verse 30, you ready? And, and so you are experiencing the same kind of conflict which you saw me endure. He's basically saying, hey, you saw me in jail for what I'm talking to you about today and what you hear to me to be mine now. Now, it's important to understand that the Apostle Paul here in his writing is, is not responding to a crisis. I urge you to understand, be very clear on this. As he wrote to express his appreciation, to uh, appreciation and affection for the Philippian believers. More than any other church, these believers in Philippi offered Paul material support for his ministry. It's very clear that Paul writes to them with a great and intense love and admiration. Now, let me just add to that. Part of that's because he's the apostle of this church. He started this church. He raised this church up. And he sees what they're doing and how they're living. And he wants to basically say, I, if, I, if I can make it, I'll exhort you. I'll build you up. I'll encourage you to keep living this vertical life that you have and manifesting at the horizontal of because everyone sees it. But if I can't make it, here's what I want you to know. So this is what he's saying. This is the context of these words we're about to, to hear. There's some things here, these first 27 through 30, that I want to give you some four quick things that I believe he's trying to communicate to us, the body of Christ. Four ways, and I'm going to say it this way, four ways that the ecclesia, the church, should reflect their spiritual life as it relates to the gospel narrative. These will be related to like what we call an external expression, what we see on the outside, what people observe in our, our worship, what people believe to be true of a church like this, not inside the walls, but outside the walls. Many years ago, we had this, this discussion, and we basically said, if 8809 La Mesa Boulevard was to go away, it just was just flattened. It was no longer in existence, no church, no people, no building, no anything. Would La Mesa even know it's gone? Years ago, I would say, uh, maybe they would have known that the building's gone and there's, there's a new grocery store up or there's a new whatever in place of it. But for the most part, they wouldn't have known that it was gone. Why? Because there are things that we be, should be doing on the outside of the building as the church, the ecclesia, that reflects the intent of God's heart for his children. I believe that's not the case today. I do believe that the city of La Mesa and others would recognize that Cross Point is no longer in existence. Why? Because we've been pursuing, I believe, the right things. The first thing I want you to catch is found in verse 27. And the apostle is exhorting them and telling them, this is what I want you to continue to manifest outside. And that's this. He said, verse 27, be sure to live, live your, lead your lives in a manner that will be worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, he is saying, I want you to walk holy. I want people to see that you take a stand for holiness. I want you to take a stand for righteousness. He, other translations and versions might say your conversations or your manner of life. Behave, literally, the translation means, I want you to behave as citizens. Now, what does that mean? There's actually some debate as to what that means. But let me just give you a very simple definition. It is believed that Paul was referencing not necessarily simply being a citizen of Rome, but rather a heavenly citizenship. To live in a manner that reflects heaven's domain while living under an earthly authority. Remember, Scripture indicates that we are, to be, we are foreigners in this planet. We're just passing through on our real final destination, a place called heaven. Let me just pause for a moment and tell you something. Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. We're not preaching that much any longer. Although there's some, some, some doomsdayers out there saying he's coming tomorrow. I don't know when he's coming, but this I want you to hear. The scripture is clear that Jesus Christ will come back for his spotless bride. He will come back for his children one day, and we must be prepared for that day. I am not promoting uh, or abdicating an escapism type of Christianity. Hide yourself out, hole up in your house, 
even though we've been sheltered in place, that's different than what I'm speaking. We need to hear this truth that we live for the day that Jesus comes back and takes us to heaven. That's a wonderful truth, right? But until that day, the apostle says that we are to do our best to live as be citizens in the country that we're living, in our cities. We are to live and behave as true citizens of heaven while living here on earth. In other words, walk in holiness, walk a right life. You notice that the apostle hasn't listed necessarily a bunch of, of rules and regulations here. Conduct your lives in a way that reflects your true home. First Peter 1.16, be ye holy for I am holy. Holiness isn't necessarily a way of doing, but it's, it's, a, it's a lifestyle of being. It doesn't mean there's not things that we do that's holy, but it's a motive of our hearts that the Father is looking for and looking at. The gospel narrative has much to say about how we're to conduct our lives and reflect the life of Jesus. Paul understood this as well as anyone. Matter of fact, in verse 20, we read in chapter 1, it is my own eager expectation and hope that looking toward the future, I will not disgrace myself nor be ashamed in anything, but that with courage and the utmost freedom of speech, even now as always, Christ will be magnified and exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. I believe the, the apostle is simply saying, it's not about the rules that you live by. It's really about the motive behind your living for the purposes of Christ. He said, I'm going to do my very best to not disgrace the gospel and to reflect the goodness of God while I live on this planet, whether by death or by life. It's pretty powerful. Second thing I want you to catch in these first few verses is verse 27. I'll go quickly through this. And the second one I believe he's saying that should manifest, that should reflect the church or the ecclesia as it relates to the gospel narrative, and that's unity, unity. It's in one spirit, verse 20, uh, 27a, I will, I, it says, uh, I will hear about you that you're standing firm in one spirit and one purpose with one mind, striving side by side, as if in combat in the faith of the gospel. One mind, one heart. The idea here is, is that we are going to be found wrestling together, not in contention with one another, but in union against the enemies of the gospel. What does the evil one want to do? He wants to rob, he wants to steal, he wants to kill. He wants to divide. I feel like he's, done a, he's doing a pretty spectacular job right now in the American church as we feel like instead of unifying, we're being divided because of politics, because of beliefs, because of voice, because of free speech, because of social media. All these things are actually contributing to the thing the apostle said. What I admire about you, Philippian church, is that you're walking unified. You're one mind. You've got one heart, and I want to honor you for that. And as the church of Jesus, the ecclesia, not cross point, but across the globe, across the, uh, uh, the spectrum, if you will, we are to be a unified people. It was Paul's heart for the church to remain unified and not fractured or fragmented because of the times. He wanted to hear that they were wrestling together for the cause of the gospel. He truly desired for them to work in unity for the purpose of the good news of the gospel so it could be trusted and believed in. Let's go to the third one quickly. The third one we find is verse 28, and that's the, the third uh, manifestation or the third view or the third uh, way that we should be mimicking, if you will, the church of Philippi is that of courage, verse 28. And in no way... And this is the amplified, in no way be alarmed or intimidated in anything by your opponent. Timidity is a reflection of a potential distrust in God. There is no doubt an indication that the church in Philippi was experiencing persecution at a pretty intense level. Paul understood persecution 
as he indicated in verse 30 of this chapter, that he's basically said to him, listen, I, I've experienced persecution. Verse 30, he says, and, and you're experiencing the same kind of conflict with what you saw me endure. He's saying, I, I, know you're, I know there's persecution against you. I know you're struggling a bit with the opposition. But he said this, do not be intimidated by the opposition. Paul is saying to his beloved Philippians, don't shrink back. Don't be alarmed at anything the opposition can throw at you. Walk courageously. Maintain your Christian integrity. Because in the end, in the end, now I'm not talking, hear me, I'm not talking about a political party. I'm not talking about a person. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about the real battle that we're in. The real battle we're in is not against flesh and blood. It's not against politics. It's not against government. It's not against particular people groups. It's not against, you know, and the list goes on. The real battle lies in the fact that this is a battle of spirit in a spiritual context. The evil one, his dominion, his demons want to destroy you and me as Christ followers. And, and Paul is saying, I know you're being persecuted, but Keep doing what I've seen you do. And he said, I've seen you walk in courage. I've seen you walk in unity. I've seen you walk in holiness as, as citizens here on earth, but reflecting the citizenship of heaven. Now I want you to continue. Now I want you to continue to reflect externally what I taught you. And the fourth thing he says is I want you to be fearless. Verse 29. Verse 29. For you've been granted the privilege of, for Christ's sake, not only to believe and confidently trust in him, but also to suffer for his sake. This, this last idea here is found the word fearlessness, courage, and, and not being intimidated are very close cousins, but uniquely different. Here's what it is. Courage is to face adversity head on and not cower from it. Whereas fearlessness is enduring to the end. I would say that fearlessness is kind of like steadfastness, not wavering in your faith, not giving up because it gets hard. I wonder how many believers right now that we've known in the church have given up because things are hard right now. I wonder how many people are, 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 are looking at at Jesus and going, where, where, where are you in the midst of all this? Listen, he's not intimidated by your questions. He's not, he's not bothered by the fact that you are pushing back. I had a moment the other day where I questioned, I'm going, I, I told Candy in the car, I go, we, we decree and we declare all the time over things. I'm not seeing the result of that right now. I'm not seeing the restaurants open on the outside so they can gather outside. I'm not seeing the breakthrough. And i got to be honest, in that moment I was a little discouraged, but my discouragement doesn't equate to, to lack of fearful, fearlessness or equate to being fearful of the times. It just simply said, this is, where I, this is what I was feeling. Paul basically teaches us not to look left or right, but knowing that God will one way or another see us through it, 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 it may be through death. I hate to say this to you, but Paul said, I, I, I know I can't come to you right now, and it's possible. Actually, I would rather die and go to be with Jesus than, than even stay around. But I know it's for your benefit that I remain. See, so if, I, if I'm able to show up and encourage you, I will. But until that day, either way, I want you to understand that you've got to stand bold. You've got to be fearless. You've got to endure to the end, whether by life or by death, Jesus will be by your side and he will take care of you. Paul says that you may suffer for my sake as a, as a consequence of knowing and serving him, but he indicates it's a privilege to suffer for him. See, you're not suffering because of you. You're suffering, we may suffer because of the person that lives inside of us. His name is Jesus. And when you embrace the person of Jesus in your life, you live for a whole different reason than simply to just wake up, take another breath, make a living, do your best to survive. No, you've been born and bought for a reason and for, with a price. And Jesus is ready to reveal that to you if we're only willing to listen and look up 
So we can say that these four things mentioned are external manifestations uh, of the spiritual life of the church. And Paul was, in essence, letting them know how they should act while he was not with them. He affirms them, but he also says continue to reflect these four things. Now, let me quickly go into these next four things found in chapter 2. Now we're going to move from the external to the internal. We're going to move from the way it should look outside the church, the way it should look, to the way it looks on the inside. How many know on the inside things aren't always as pretty as they seem? Philippians chapter 2, 1 through 4. I'm going to, for the sake of time, we're not going to read those, but I'm going to move on to just begin to explain. In verse, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it begins with therefore, and I want you to understand something about the word therefore. Whenever you read the word therefore in the scripture, it almost always is rendered make note of, or let me bring further clarification of what I just shared with you. In today's vernacular, it could be something like, yo, check this out. This is really good. Pay attention to what I'm about to say. So Paul's saying what I shared with you regarding what should be seen externally from the believers of the Ecclesia and Philippi, now I want you to turn your attention to the internal struggles that can happen within the church. Therefore, it's very important that you be motivated by what I'm about to share. In verse 1, it says, if, any, if, if, if there is anything, if there's any, listen to this. Paul is saying that if anything I have mentioned to you, you have received from me, then you have a responsibility to do what I'm going to describe. They are a type of motivation. These are motivational virtues, if you will, that move us towards being the church that Paul is describing here. Let me just kind of summarize, summarize what he is saying in verse 1. If there's any consolation in Christ, rhetorical question. Amplified says that there's an abundance of consolation, consolation to be found in his word. So it's rhetorical. If, if you can find any consolation in Jesus, if there's any comfort of love, another rhetorical question, because that affirms the great comfort of love that Jesus does bring. He, he says, he says, if there's any fellowship of the Spirit, referencing uh, koinonia, which we know that the Church of Philippi practiced Christian fellowship. He said, if, if there's any intimate fellowship among Christians by their being made mutual, if there's any affection and mercy, he said, if any of these things are to be found in you, which he knows they are, he said this in verse 2, fulfill or complete my joy. What Paul is saying, he's appealing to the church, the ecclesia, and their experiences, Christ's followers, by saying if these experiences are in fact real, if the encounters that you've had with Jesus are in fact real, facts that are verified in, in the life of a believer real time, not just through talk and superficial official living, not just, but if these things are true, he said, now complete my joy by doing the following. Are you ready for this? Complete my joy. How can we complete? Was Paul not happy with the, with the Philippians? No, he was very happy with them. But he said, I, you can bring complete satisfaction to my life if you'll take note of what I'm about to share with you. Paul, we know, is the apostle of the church. He's the apostle very affectionate towards them, and we know that what he's about to share is, is about as intimate and as passionate as we possibly can get from the apostle. Verse 2, chapter 2, make my joy complete by being of the same mind. This could render that he wants the, 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 the ecclesia, the members of the church of Philippi, Philippi to have true sympathy, like-mindedness. It, it, it isn't thinking the same about all things. That's not like-mindedness. Paul connects like-mindedness with a heart that is sympathetic. That actually, in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 16, ESV says, live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. NIV, Romans 15, 5, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you the same attitude and mind towards each other that Christ had so that 
one mind and one voice, you will glorify God, the Father of Jesus Christ. So that having the same mind, the apostle is saying, is it's connected to thinking the thoughts of Jesus out of, as it relates to others. A, a, here it is. It's, it's a willingness to associate with people outside your comfort zone and your circle of comfort and we would say it around here, be willing to associate with the misfits, the outsiders, the outcasts of our world. It's the woman at the well, real world living. Being at the wrong place at the right time. So the person that is in the moment in your life is the beneficiary of you being in that location, in that place. I don't know if I've said that well, but I think you catch it. The second thing I want you to quickly catch is he says, be of the same mind. Now I want you to be of the same love. We're talking out of chapter 2 here, verse 2, same love. He goes on further to support this by saying, have the same love toward one another. It's a different way of being intentionally sympathetic for those that aren't like me. Now he's saying, I want you to have the same love one towards another. He now links the mind and the heart together. So much of our issues in the body of Christ are heart-related issues. The idea of love is found here is the word agape. It's pure love. It's unadulterated love. It's the love of the Father. It's the kind of love it's not so emotional as it is a motivation to do things that will benefit the other person. You might know what to do, but when it hits your heart and you're motivated to do it, then the heart and the mind come, come together in agreement and you begin to function the way that Paul said, I want you to function in the church at Philippi. It's the benefit of another person. It's mutual love. It's a heart and a mind that's unselfish in its concern about their own well-being in seeking out the best for another. These next two, we'll quickly go through. Being of one accord and one mind si sounds similar. Being of one accord of one soul, having your souls knit together. The word used here does not occur anywhere else in the New Testament. It means a union of soul or an acting together as if but one soul uh, connected or uni uh, being, uh, put together. Wouldn't that be wonderful if we could see the church of Jesus function this way? One accord, one soul, one heart, one mind. We wouldn't be warring over so many things. Being of one mind, being of one accord, very close, but in the, in, of one mind in the original language it was thinking the same thing. Now, it's not being like-minded. It's thinking the same thing. Listen to this. The apostle year uses a great variation, uh, variety of expressions to, to say the same thing. The object which he aimed at was the union of the heart, of feeling, of plan, of purpose. He wished him to avoid all divisions and strifes and to show the power of Christendom, of a unified ecclesia, by and be united in the common cause. Probably there's no single thing so much insisted in the New Testament as in being important is the harmony among believers. Now, that, that, now there is almost nothing so little known or, or have we seen in the church, um, let me say it this way, if we could see this take place in the church of the Western church, we would see quickly a nation converted to God. The problem is, that we're all made up of broken people. And although Paul is saying, I, I need you to reflect what I believe, I need you to do what I'm telling you to do. This is how it would fulfill my joy. And I don't believe he was seeing this division in, in the church of Philippi, but he's saying, you need to continue doing this to fulfill my joy in my life. What hinders, and this is how we'll wrap this up, what what is it that keeps us from functioning the way that the apostle spoke of here in chapter 2, verse 2? Verse 3, it says, do nothing out of contention. Verse 3, do nothing out of selfishness or empty conceit. What is inconsistent with our thinking, uh, which is inconsistent with our thinking? Some versions use the word vainglory. 
desire praise, which is directly opposite to the love of God. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Do nothing out of contention. But esteem each other better than ourselves. For everyone knows more evil of himself than he can of another. This is what it's saying, which is a glorious fruit of the Spirit. And it's very something that we ought to pursue as we continue to f- f- focus on one soul coming together. This is the point. Christian, for, for, for Christian unity, that which the apostle pleads isn't just agreeing in doctrine or styles of worship or even a unified missional mandate. It's found in unity of heart as well as mind. We don't have to agree on everything. We don't have to, we don't have to think that we're, you know, it's, it's a matter of submitting our hearts one to another and saying, God, help me to stay low and to reach high. Is it possible in the natural when disagreements and offenses rise up Is it possible for us to be able to to work through those things and reflect what Jesus is teaching to the Apostle Paul here? I believe so. Actually, what Paul's saying is that this kind of faction found in in verse um, 17, excuse me, um, Paul Paul mentions two things here as it relates works, works against kingdom unity. Number one, selfish ambition, which we mentioned. That's the spirit that aligns with others of a like mind, which encourages strife or division. And it says, in the second one is vainglory, which is conceit, which I touched on. We've all known of someone that's conceited, self-centered, never willing to concede. I said this before, but a religious spirit never concedes. And often those that bring division to the body of Christ aren't those whose head is filled with God thoughts. They're filled with human thoughts. They're filled with empty-headed thoughts at times because they're full of themselves. We've all seen it in the body of Christ. We've seen it in platforms in the church across America. It's not that they're not brilliant leaders or brilliant preachers, but it's the fact that when we begin to get our eyes off of Jesus, when we begin to live for our own ambition, our own dreams, and our own selfish desires, it begins to break down what God has spoken through. Paul here is what it looks like to reflect him and the kingdom. For the sake of time, let me just wrap this up. There's so much that can be found in these passages. Verse 3, second part of verse 3 says, have an attitude of humility, be neither ignorant, uh, arrogant nor self-righteous. Regard others as more important than yourselves. Then he continues on verse 4, don't merely look on your own personal interest, but also for the interest of others. I guess what we could say is this, is that when Jesus came to the planet, he was a perfect example. He said, listen, I may be the son of God, but I need you to practice this. I didn't come to be served, but I came to give my life away. I really believe the apostle Paul understood this as he's telling the church at Philippi. Externally, this is how you're to continue to reflect Jesus and his kingdom. Now, internally, do your best to keep your hearts pure to be motivated by only what I'm motivating you to do, to love each other, to keep one heart, one mind, one soul, and do your best to not let anything that's of the flesh dominate and compel you to do things that I'm not asking you to do. Look at others, relate to them, sympathize with them, have compassion for them, love the one that's in front of you. I really believe that's what Paul is trying to say where true humility and unselfishness are dominant virtues in the local ecclesia, you will witness Paul's desire of the church being of one accord and of one mind. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Philippians. Thank you for the Apostle Paul. Thank you for a church called Philippi that was a reflection of a great apostle's leadership and for people that were willing to hear and learn from the apostle. Thanks for reflecting the heart of Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We thank you today for your word. We thank you for our time together. It's in your name we pray. Amen.